Well, good afternoon and welcome to H360 Live. My name is Dave Duplay and I'm joined here in the studio this afternoon with my good friend and colleague, Miss Cortland Long. Cortland, how are we doing today? I'm great, Dave. How are you? I'm doing great. Well, the weather is finally getting colder. Mm -hmm. It is the middle of January. It's to be expected. Yeah, it's pretty bitter out there today, though. It is bitter out there. Now, we just got back from California. The weather was fantastic yeah. out there. <laughs> A little chilly. It had rain one day, mm -hmm. but we were out there attending uh, the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference, and what a great conference that was. You know, Cortland, some of the innovative technology that we've seen, we got to interview about 18 CEOs. They, uh, we're going to be broadcasting those videos, those interviews on Healthy 360 so stay tuned for that. But it was all about these new and innovative therapies that these companies are working on. And wow, mm -hmm. you really talk about some innovation. Um, it was great. Yeah, it was really exciting to see a lot of the new things that are coming down the pipeline. One of the ones that was most exciting was the device that detects pressure ulcers before they are um, visible to the naked eye. Yeah, you know, that was a great device. Mm -hmm. And you know, these people that are in the hospital and they get pressure ulcers, there's nothing worse. And by the time in, you know, today's world, uh, identification, you know, visually, it's almost mm -hmm. too late. You know, the, the sore is going to develop and yeah. nothing good happens from there. So that was great technology. Yeah, it was really interesting. There's a lot more to come. Yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of technology, today our guest is Dr. Ira Jacobs. He is from Pfizer Pharmaceutical. Well, right here in New York City, not far from our office, and we're so happy to have him. He's going to be coming in in just a little bit. We're going to be talking about uh, something called biosimilars, and you know, Pfizer is one of the leaders in this area, doing some really great work. We're going to teach you about what is a biosimilar, mm -hmm. how do they work, and all of the things that you need to know around biosimilars and the great work that Pfizer is doing in that area. Portland, but first, as you know, we always have our health tips, and today is no exception. The health tips today are pretty appropriate for the cool weather that's coming in. <laughs> Um, you know, it's about uh, how to brave the w winter weather. Yeah, for the cool weather, I would say the freezing cold weather. So for those of us who live in uh, areas where it gets cold and dark and snowy during the winter, these tips are especially for you. It can be really happy to try to stay, uh, it can be really difficult to try to stay happy during the winter. So <clears throat> these tips are going to be uh, really perfect. And so the first tip is to winterize your workout. Now I know that it can be really tough to get the energy to go to the gym in the winter. And you know, Dave, it's really important for me to go to the gym. I know it's very important for you to go to the gym. So winterizing your workout is a key tip here. Exercise also can really lift your mood and that boost is going to be incredibly important in the winter, especially for people who deal with seasonal affective disorder. So to try to help you winterize your workout, try to develop a workout schedule at the beginning of the week. And if you hit all of your goals throughout that week, give yourself a little reward at the end of the week. Yeah, you know, Cortland, I'm all about the reward at the end of the week. Yeah. You know, I wear this little device on my <laughs> wrist and I get a little badge if I'm a good boy and I exercise. Uh -huh. But winterizing your workout, you know, think about it. We winterize our car, we winterize our boat if you have one. We've got to winterize our workout, right? Yeah. And I agree, you know, it gets uh, darker earlier mm -hmm. and lighter later in these winter months. And yeah. yeah, it's a real challenge getting out of that warm bed, making my way to the gym at 6.30 for that spin class. But you know, I do it. Yes, you've winterized your workout and you give yourself <clears throat> a reward. Uh, exactly right. So great health tip, winterize your workout. Health tip number two coming your way is eat your way up beet. Um, and I don't, I'm not talking about the red beets. I'm talking about certain foods that are good and good for you. So in the winter months, it's always best, you know, uh, protein is always good. You know, we want to include that in our meal. We want to include a lot of fiber also in the winter time. You know, it's going to keep us going. It's going to keep us regular. Mm -hmm. We also want to include um, foods with omega-3 fatty acids. Now, Cortland, you know where we get that from wild salmon. Wild salmon. Yeah. Act, actually, that's right, and it's better than farm-raised salmon. So you want to find the wild salmon. If you can't, farm-raised salmon is going to get you there as well, but search out that um, wild salmon, and you're really going to love the taste of that, and it's going to be good for you as well. Um, you know what I like to do in the wintertime? What's that? I like a bowl of hot oatmeal in the morning to get me started. Oh, now you're talking my language. I am yep. talking your language, and you mm. know what I like to put in my oatmeal? 
blueberries. Blueberries, maybe some strawberries, uh -huh. a banana or two. So eat your way upbeat. Remember, you got to eat healthy. Um, you know, and if you're exercising, you really, you know, you're going to burn that off. So mm -hmm. uh, eat your way upbeat is the second tip. Keep that in mind. That is a really great tip. You know, eating those really good comfort foods, but not the fatty comfort foods is um, really important during the winter. So tip number three is to get your group on. Being social is really important for your health, so don't use the winter as an excuse to hibernate. You still need to get out of the house, um, hang out with your friends, you know, try to stay away from developing cabin fever. So a really good way to get your group on is to try planning <coughs> some recurring events or you know, taking some fun classes with your friends building in those buddy moments into your weekly calendar or monthly calendar will be really beneficial here. So again, taking classes or joining a book club of sorts is going to be really helpful. Now, Cortland, I have to tell you, I get my Groupon on my iPhone. Do you? Yeah. Isn't that the what coupon we're service? Yeah. Is that not where we're... Oh, I must have missed it. Right. Groupon, not that Groupon. Uh -huh. But although, if you do go on Groupon, which is a fantastic site, by the way, you can find uh, coupons for exercising. You yeah. can find coupons for healthy eating. And art classes. Stuff art yeah. classes, absolutely. But mm -hmm. get your group on is a good one. And I agree, you know, especially you know, we're in New York City here. And the apartments tend to be a little on the smaller side. And if you happen to have a roommate and in the winter you get that cabin fever, yeah. you're kind of walking all over each other. So get your group on. Get out there. Join a book club. Get out with your friends. See some things. Mm -hmm. Go to the gym, mm -hmm. right? Winterize your workout. Yeah. Eat up, beat. Organize yeah. a potluck dinner for or, your friends. Exactly. Uh -huh. What are we having? Uh, pot roast. Okay. <laughs> All right. That sounds great. Well, Cortland, you know, uh, great health tips. Um, but as always, we sent our interns out in the field to Bryant Park to see what our friendly New Yorkers know about some of these health tips and what they think about surviving the cold winter months here in New York. So would you like to watch the video? I would love to. All right. Roll the tape, please. Enjoy the winter or do you struggle due to a mood or energy? I do not like the winter. <laughs> <You don't. laughs> Why not? Um, it gets dark too early. It's yeah. very cold. Yeah. I like to juggle and be outside a lot. Yeah, I struggle with the winter. You Definitely, with yeah. I say I struggle with it energy wise. Mm -hmm. I've never been, you know, spent a winter in New York and it's been atrocious so far. <laughs> oh man. I love the winter. You love the winter? Yes. Love the cold. You love the cold? Yep. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm a skier and a snowboarder. Really? Yep. Wow. Do you have a winter workout routine? And if so, what is it? Um, well, not here, because I'm on holidays. In Australia, yeah, I guess. You do? So, so what, do you, what do you do? Like, go for runs. I would go okay. for runs at night. At night? Yeah. Do you think that's the best time to go and run? Well, probably not, but that's when <laughs> I always run, at like okay. 10 o'clock at night. No, I don't. You don't? No. <laughs> just just bearing, you know, walking these frozen tundra of streets is enough for me, so I don't, I don't, I don't really like doing any, you know, like calisthenics or anything. Okay, <laughs> you know? all right. You I juggle at least an hour a day. Sometimes during the summer, it's like four hours a day because okay. I'm outside a lot more, but... Um, and it is a physical workout, uh -huh. especially club passing. Yeah. And we have we have some heavy balls in there that are two pounds each, and so juggling those is a real workout too. Yeah. Yeah. In the winter, a lot of people eat comfort foods. Do you um, eat a lot of comfort foods? I really like um, Indian food. Okay. So very spicy uh, vindaloo. Okay. Or chicken tikka. During the winter, I lean towards comfort foods, sweets, uh -huh. and stuff. You know. Yeah. You mm, yes. You do? Yeah. So what would be some of those comfort foods that you like to eat? Pizza, <laughs> hot chocolate. More bread. Uh-huh. More like pasta. Okay. More carbs, definitely, yeah. Do you like to plan a lot of group activities when it comes to the winter time to stay out of the house? Yeah, um, skiing and snowboarding with friends. Okay, And great. rock climbing. Really? Wow. I probably do it more in summer. Do You do it more in the summertime? Yeah. I mean, I can't go out all the time, but, yeah. I, you know, definitely like to plan some stuff, you know, weekends, have something where like you know just look forward to you know well we do this year round okay. so this is always here um, every day at lunch and Tuesday nights okay um, other than this I don't really plan anything else outside Okay. <laughs> everything else is inside okay. sometimes we get together and do group skates
Wow. I mean, the character yeah. juggling, what did you think? He was fantastic, and I really liked that he still, in the winter, is out there getting some sun, some vitamin D, trying to be healthy and active. He's making it happen. Now, his mm -hmm. beard did look a little frozen. No. <laughs> no? That was my imagination? I think it was okay. He had the gray thing going on, uh -huh. so that's okay, but he yeah. was doing a good job. And the rest of them that we interviewed, um, they were really in tune. The whole cabin fever thing, mm -hmm. it seemed like people were getting out doing things. I think they really resonated with all of our health tips. Yeah, I found it interesting that the one girl goes running at 10 p.m. Wow, yeah, I hope she's yeah. running somewhere that's well lit. Because yeah. you do know, in the wintertime, you have to be careful with the black ice. Yes, you do. <clears throat> yeah, because it, you know, a little, a little dampness on the sidewalk, and then the temperature really drops significantly, and that is a recipe for disaster. I'm speaking from experience. I took that fall last year, and that mm -hmm. was no fun. I wasn't running, just simply walking to the office. Yeah, very dangerous. Yeah, so you got to watch that. Uh, and now, Cortland, our favorite time of the show, uh, Dr. Jacobs is in the studio with us. Just to refresh your memory, Dr. Jacobs works for one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, which is Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. We're so happy to have them here because they are doing some really innovative work over there at Pfizer uh, for patients and uh, caregivers alike. So, uh, but before we uh, start our Q&A, Cortland, I've got some statistics I'd like to go through just to kind of tee it up for everybody uh, to, you know, set the stage for what we're talking about here. So uh, many of the important medications today are biological products made from living organisms such as humans, animals, bacteria, and yeast. Biologics are among the medications used to treat rheumatoid arthritis, uh, IBD, psoriasis, certain types of cancers. So they're really working on some important things at Pfizer. Many biological products are more complex in structure and have larger mixtures of molecules than conventional drugs. We're going to learn all about that. Um, so Cortland, um, it is so good to have Dr. Jacobs in. So doctor, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. We have a lot of questions we want to ask you, and you guys are really on the leading edge in terms of biosimilars at Pfizer. Um, and so let's just jump right in because uh, we want to get through all of our questions and really educate our viewership on what you're working on. Sure. Yes, yeah, so Dr. Jacobs, again, thank you for coming in. We're really excited to speak with you about biosimilars. We have many uh, patients and caregivers in our community who are living with these conditions that Dave mentioned earlier. So let's start off with hopefully a pretty easy question, can you explain to our um, viewers what exactly are biosimilars? Sure, I think that the easiest way to, is to actually look at the word bio and similars. So these drugs are biologics, which means that they're made by living cells um, or living organisms, um, and they're highly similar to drugs that are already on the market. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're not the exact same, but they're highly similar. Okay. So. Um, Dr. Jacobs, in my introduction, I mentioned that um, some of the biosimilars are more complex uh, than smaller molecule drugs. Can you explain that to our viewers? Sure. So when we look at drugs, we look at sort of their, their atomic weight or their molecular weight, and we can see that um, typical drugs like um, simple generic drugs or drugs that we use um, are aspirin or acetaminophen, and they're smaller in their molecular weight. And then as we go up, as they become more complex, so insulin, or then, you know, for instance, drugs to treat rheumatoid arthritis or cancer, they become larger in size in their structure. So they're much more complicated. Hmm. So you, you mentioned the word generics. So in the scheme of things, where, where does generics fit in with, you know, so we've got branded products, um, and then we have generics, and now we're introducing biosimilars. How do generics and biosimilars differ? So I think the easiest way to understand it is when a, a drug um, is made by a pharmaceutical company um, and it comes to the market, it has a patent. So we cannot duplicate that. Um, and for instance, certain drugs, um, we can, once their patent expires, again, aspirin or acetaminophen, a company can go out and make an exact duplicate. So the chemical structure is exactly the same thing. Um, when you have some more complex uh, drugs, these biologics, they are more complicated. Um, and when their patent expires, we can't exactly duplicate them, um, but we can make something very close to or highly similar to what that drug is. So you say you can't duplicate it exactly. 
So how do you figure out what to put into the biosimilar? So what we do to make a biosimilar is we buy that product that's on the market. We usually call it the reference product or the originator product. And then what we do in our labs is we break it down to its um, chemical structure, its amino acid sequence. And then what we'll do is we'll rebuild it. So these drugs are made, as you said earlier, in, in living cells. So we may use a different living cell to grow these drugs and put them together. And then we'll sort of reconstruct it um, and, and make a, a new drug. Hmm. Dr. Jacobs, as I understand it, there are also interchangeable biologic products. So how do these differ from biosimilars? Sure. So as we said, once a, a small molecule drug loses its patent, you see generics on the market. So when you go to the store, you can buy the store brand or you can buy a drug that's made by different manufacturers. When we have, uh, and, they're, and they're sort of, as you said, interchangeable. So if you bought one or the other, you'd have the same effect. It, it would have the same effect on your body. They would all have the same um, safety profile, so they'd be a safe, um, and it would actually give you the result that you needed to. Mm -hmm. With biologics, um, the, uh, because they're not exactly the same, um, we don't want them to be interchangeable without speaking to your physician about them. So they're highly similar. They will have the same effect. The safety effects or the safety profile should be the same. But again, this is something that, you know, as a patient, you should talk to your physician about. Mm -hmm. So, uh, doctor, we've had some questions come in from um, some of our members. They were emailed in the other day. So I'd like to take us through a couple of those. So Tom from Ridgewood, New Jersey. Tom, thanks for writing. And he says, how can I find out if there's a biosimilar for the current medications I'm taking today? So in the United States right now, um, this is, a, is something new. We've only had one biosimilar that's come on the market, but lots of drug developers are making them um, for different molecules. So I, I guess an easy way is either to go on um, to the drug company's website, either Pfizer or other manufacturers and look, um, and you can see, um, they usually list the products that are in development. So you can look and see what biosimilars are in development in their pipeline. Or um, there's a site, clinicaltrials.gov, and that's a site um, maintained, and you can type in you know, your condition or the drug you're taking and the word biosimilar, and you can see if there are any trials um, or, uh, you know, that are currently in progress recruiting for those so, drugs. Um, okay, so um, that's great. We can go on Pfizer.com and see. Absolutely. Um, so I suggest you go there, check that out. Um, also, you'd mentioned that biosimilars go through um, a level of clinical trial testing as well. Um, so the next question comes from Sue. She's from Canton, Ohio. Sue, I love Canton, Ohio. You know, the, the Football Hall of Fame is in Canton, uh -huh. and I've been there. If you, have you been there? I have not. Oh, if you ever get to Canton, you have to go. It's fantastic. But Sue writes, and she says, I've been diagnosed with uh, COPD, among other respiratory conditions. How can I find out if I qualify for a clinical trial? So again, I think whatever website you look at, whether it be you know Pfizer's website, um, another company's website, um, a clinical trial website, they usually list um, what inclusion or exclusion criteria are needed to be part of the trial. So what conditions should you have? What um, conditions can't you have to fit into that? And you can always you know kind of either write that down, print that out, bring it to your doctor, um, and ask them. You know, I, I saw this online. Would I would I qualify for a trial? Yeah. You know, there's so many misnomers around trials, and it really is frustrating to me to hear some of them. Um, and one kind of centers around the quality of care you might receive if you're in a clinical trial. And, you know, I just want to make people aware that, you know, when you're in a clinical trial, um, and I have had family members participate in trials and friends, the, the care is exceptional. You know, there's so many controls and regulations put into place that the care is just really, really um, over the top great and you get a lot of um, you know very well-known physicians who conduct these clinical trials so um, go on the website take a look see what trials are in your area and if you qualify um, you know you'll be doing a good thing we have one more question coming in from Karen from Andover Mass and Cortland this question is for you yeah. you've got some fan fan base out there it says Cortland I watch H360 live every week and I'm a big fan 
Uh, she says, each week you always look so put together. <laughs> Can you tell me where you purchase your outfits? <laughs> oh, uh, hi, Karen. Uh, thank you so much for your message and your question. Um, I purchase a lot of my clothing from Ann Taylor. And you always look put together. Thank you. I, I, I should take a few notes. Yeah, I, I don't didn't think get they any have questions on my wardrobe. I'm, I don't know <laughs> if I have a fan base. However, let's move back to the subject biosimilars with Dr. Jacobs. Um, so, Doctor, um, in an earlier conversation, you told us that many biologic patents are going to be expiring in the coming years, especially those in oncology. And this is an area, you know, it's gotten a lot of visibility. Um, you know, um, Vice President Biden has put a kind of a stake in the ground, which I think is fantastic. My hope is there that we all get together and collaborate and share data because we absolutely have to find a cure for cancer. But getting back to this question here, um, so with these patents expiring, what is that going to mean for pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer? With, with patents expiring, it, it gives an opportunity for patients to get better access to these medications. So now that the patent is no longer there, other manufacturers can make these products. So therefore, patients who may not be able to have gotten them before for various reasons or barriers to getting them, the hope is that now because there are more manufacturers making them, that they'll be able to get access to the drugs that they need, as you said, to help treat these conditions. Yeah, access seems to be a, a reoccurring theme when we go to mm -hmm. a lot of conferences and we listen in on some of the advocacy discussions. Um, you know, cost of medication and access is always at the top of the list. You know, how do some of these countries get access to these medications to save lives? So that's, that's great news for people out there watching to know that with these patents expiring, you're gonna, it's going to open up um, more options for treatment. Absolutely. But Dr. Jacobs, first I'd like to talk about the approval process um, really quickly. And as I understand it, the approval process for a biosimilar is greater than that for a small molecule generic drug but potentially less than that for a biologic. So can you walk us through some of the differences here in the approval processes? Sure, I think the best way to think of it is, is this is a tailored process. And because of the Affordable Care Act, or what many people refer to as Obamacare, this pathway was created for biosimilars to be brought to the market. So on one extreme, if you want to say, where, with a, a, a novel drug or a, you know, a new innovative drug, there's a very long process, so it involves a lot of work in the lab, um, clinical trials, and these are very large clinical trials where you could have three, 4,000 patients. On the other spectrum is the generic molecule. So these, uh, for instance, small molecules like acetaminophen or aspirin, once they've lost their patent, other manufacturers can chemically uh, make the same drug, and they really just have to do a small study, not in patients, but just showing that the um, active ingredients are the same. So then we have biosimilars in the middle. So this still uh, involves a lot of research, mostly on the bench, because as we said, we're gonna take that um, reference product or the product that's on the market, break it down, rebuild it. And all of the steps that we do in the regulatory um, pathway is to make sure we're the same as. So we're gonna do a lot of analytical work showing that, for instance, the drug binds um, to the cells that we want it to. The drug works the way we want it to in the lab. Um, and this is probably the biggest portion of what we do. And then we bring it into patients. So we'll do a smaller trial, again, uh, in healthy volunteers usually, just looking to make sure that it's doing what we want it to. And then lastly, we'll do these clinical trials like you had mentioned, but these are not um, looking at the same patient numbers that we would with an originator molecule. So, you know, these are probably in the range of, say, three to 700 patients. So with these biosimilars coming onto the market, treatment choices now open up for patients. Um, is it possible that a patient could react um, better to a biosimilar than to the reference product? So really, the way that these are made are to be as similar as we can be to that originator product. So if you didn't respond to the originator product or your, your disease, whether it be cancer or arthritis, it didn't work in that setting with the originator drug, you wouldn't really want to try this drug because it's the same thing. It works through the same pathway. It has the same mechanism of action. It binds to the same cells. 
So really, it should have the same effect. It should be as safe as, it should have the same um, profile that that other drug does. So since biosimilars can offer a lower cost alternative to um, the off-patent biopharmaceuticals, uh, this has the potential to really increase life-saving medications for those who um, are, you know, lower income families are not able to afford the biopharmaceuticals, is that correct? So how, how are the, biopharm the biosimilars, you know, less than the biopharmaceuticals? Well, we know, um, depending on the drug or what, it, what country we're in or their tenders, that uh, biosimilars will be priced less than that of the originator drug. So with that, we hope that this will expand the access to patients who need it. Because regardless of whether you're outside of the U.S. or even in the U.S., many patients, whether it be for their cancer treatment, for their arthritis treatment, even to help with white blood cell or red blood cell production or even insulin, they're not always getting the drugs they need, even if it's going to help their condition. And that could be for a various you know, number of reasons. But the hope is that with biosimilars coming onto the market, that we can kind of eliminate these barriers so all the patients who actually should be getting the drug do get the drug. So, um, you know, I, I know that uh, the FDA is um, fast-tracking some products to market, especially in the area of oncology. Um, are biosimilars able to take advantage of that fast-track process as well? There, there's not a specific fast-track. I think when you look at the entire pathway, it's shorter. Um, as you mentioned, you know, we, we, we need patients to enroll in clinical trials. Um, to get these drugs to the market. So that's usually what takes the longest amount of time, whether it be for a reference drug, you know, these drugs that are, are now on the market, or for biosimilars. So by, you know, looking at the sample size or the number of patients in these trials, because they're probably thousands of patients less, we're able to get them to the market faster as soon as we can. Um, but again, you have to take into uh, consideration the patent for that drug and when that patent expires. Yeah. Well, Dr. Jacobs, unfortunately, I think we're almost out of time here on H360 Live, but if you had one thing that you really wanted patients and caregivers to take away from our discussion today, what would your message be? Well, I think patients and, and caregivers need to understand what biosimilars are. This is nothing new. They're just a different name for medications, um, that they are safe and they are efficacious, and once they come out, that they really should be considered as an, an, another option for patients um, to be treated with. Well, Doctor, this has been very uh, informative and enlightening. Thanks for coming into the studio. I have to tell you, I really admire the work that you guys are doing over at Pfizer. You've got uh, some terrific products on the market, and I know that you've got some things in the pipeline that are really going to make a difference um, for the patients out there, many of whom are in the Healthy 360 community. So I really applaud you guys for that and appreciate you coming in. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, and I have to thank our sponsors, as always, for making this all possible. Remember, all of our episodes can be viewed on demand at HealthyO360.com, and our podcast can be found in the iTunes store. Well, Cortland, I think you have something to share about our social media efforts? Oh, yes. Well, we are all over social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. We use the hashtag real stories when posting, and we'd really appreciate it if you would do the same. On behalf of Dave Duplay, myself, and the entire Healthy 360 family, we'd like to thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you again next week when we're chatting with Dr. Lichterov about thyroid cancer. But before we leave you today, we'd like to send you off with a short informational video by Pfizer for patients who are considering clinical trials for biosimilars. If you or someone you love has a life-threatening or chronic illness, you know how overwhelming it can be. You probably have dozens of questions. We hope this video provides some useful information. Many serious diseases are treated with drugs called biologic medicines or biopharmaceuticals, biologics for short. You may be familiar with some common biologics, such as human insulin, vaccines, and blood clotting products. Doctors have been using biologics to treat serious diseases for decades, but biologics are not available to everyone who may benefit from them. 
helping patients get the treatment they need. Pfizer develops and produces many types of drugs, including biologics. Pfizer now is developing and studying a type of biologic called a biosimilar. Learning more about biosimilars. The word biosimilar is made by combining part of the word biologic and the word similar. A biologic is a medicine produced from living cells. A biosimilar is a biologic medicine made in living cells too. Biosimilars are intended to reflect the key features of the original biologic medicine. Biosimilars are not generic drugs. Pfizer is working with doctors and patients around the world to study and develop biosimilars with the goal of getting more patients the medicines they need. Consider a Pfizer Reflections Biosimilar Clinical Trial. People join clinical trials for many different reasons. For the care they get in a clinical trial, for treatment that might not be accessible otherwise, and to help doctors find treatments that may help other patients. Here are some other facts to consider when thinking about joining a Reflections trial. Reflections trials are designed to compare the proposed biosimilar with the original biologic and show that they have similar safety and effectiveness. Before conducting a reflection study in patients, Pfizer has done laboratory tests to show that their biosimilar mirrors the structure of the original biologic. All patients in Pfizer Reflections clinical trials get an active treatment. Some will receive the original biologic and some will get the biosimilar being studied. Patients do not get a placebo, that is a substance that is known not to work. How to join a Pfizer Reflections clinical trial. You can learn more about how to join a Pfizer Reflections clinical trial by talking to your doctor or healthcare professional. After certain medical criteria have been met, you and your doctor can decide if a Pfizer Reflections clinical trial is right for you. Usually, you do not need a referral from your doctor to join a Reflections clinical trial. If you do join but later change your mind, you are always free to leave the study. There can be risks and benefits in any clinical trial. That's why clinical trials are carefully designed and closely monitored. On behalf of Pfizer and the many hundreds of researchers, doctors, nurses, and most importantly, patients around the world involved in reflections, thank you.